Coming up, one of Newsweek's reporters is being held in prison in Iran. His wife, six and a half months pregnant with their first child, joins us to tell us what is being done to try to get him out. Honestly, I hate that we're developing almost a, a, a template for how to cover these journalists in jail for no reason other than doing his or her job stories. We take a lot of freedoms for granted. Freedom of the press, really not being taken for granted, especially not this year. That very dramatic story is coming up. But first, it's time for a couple of holy mackerel stories in today's news. The New York Times completed its two-part series today on the history of the Bush administration's torture program. Now, this is not the big picture stuff about why we were torturing people, not the whose idea was it stuff. It's, it's not even the how did they think they'd get away with it stuff. What they have reported on, what the Times has reported on these past two days is actually the small stuff, really detailed reporting yesterday on the two guys who were paid millions of dollars to design the how to to instructions for torture. These are the guys who wrote up quite literally the blow by blow for how Americans should torture prisoners during the Bush administration. We now know that Bruce Jessen and Jim Mitchell had never ever in their entire lives ever done a single interrogation when the geniuses in the Bush administration d decided to pay them to overrule every experienced interrogator in the US government so they could implement their made up reverse engineered get a false confession torture program. Jim Mitchell's academic expertise, for example, was comparing the effects of diet and exercise for combating hypertension. But that didn't stop him from getting the contract to design the torture program. In part two of the series, we learned today of another aspect of the torture program that was not only toxic to our values, counter strategic in terms of our national security, potentially dangerous in terms of the safety of Americans around the world. Today, we learn of another aspect of the torture program that was not just strategically and morally bankrupt, but was actually just pathetic. When the Bush administration decided that the CIA should build secret prisons in other countries to administer its torture program, they turned to a CIA operator named Dusty Fago to build those prisons. The name Dusty Fago may be familiar to you because he's in jail for corruption. Mr. Fago pled guilty to giving padded, top-dollar CIA supply contracts to a buddy of his, who then repaid the favor by taking Dusty on really expensive vacations, by paying for some of Dusty's rather lavish living expenses, and by promising Dusty a job once he was out of the CIA. Dusty's friend is a guy named Brent Wilkes. That name may also be familiar to you because he's also in prison right now for bribing Republican Congressman Duke Cunningham. Corrupt, imprisoned Dusty Fago and his corrupt, imprisoned contractor friend Brent Wilkes are the guys the Bush administration hired to build and equip their secret torture prisons in Romania and Morocco and some unnamed other former Eastern Bloc city. Like, it's not bad enough. We have to live with the fact that the last president set up a torture program for the United States. We also have to live with the fact that it was pathetically, horrendously, or horrendously, embarrassingly corrupt. Is it wrong to have expected higher standards from my government's secret prison and torture program? 